Good evening. My name is Dr. Edward Archer. I'm an obesity theorist and computational physiologist at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. We're here to speak about your upcoming paper entitled The Inadmissibility of What We Eat in America and NHANES Dietary Data in Nutrition and Obesity Research in the Scientific Formulation of National Dietary Guidelines, which will be published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Tell us about your paper. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to begin by thanking my co-authors, my esteemed co-authors, Dr. Gregory Pavella and Dr. Carl Tripp Levy for their invaluable contributions to this project. And I'd also like to thank the editors and staff of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. They're a journal that truly cares about science. My colleagues and I wrote this paper because the biggest problem in nutrition and obesity research is a lack of science. We have a large number of individuals with advanced degrees such as MDs and PhDs conducting scientifically incompetent research. And we argue that the essence of science is the ability to discern fact from fiction. And we present evidence from multiple fields to support our position that the data generated from nutrition epidemiologic surveys and questionnaires are not falsifiable. As such, these data are pseudoscientific and inadmissible in scientific research. And the resultant data should not be used to inform national dietary guidelines or public health policy. And the continued funding of these methods constitutes an unscientific and major misuse of research resources. But more importantly, the shifting sands of nutrition dietary guidelines have, you know, of sodium, of salt, of fat, of protein, what we should eat. Insofar as nutrition epidemiology's job is to tell us and answer the simple question, what should we eat? They've failed miserably over the past 50 years. And this has decreased the legitimacy of science to inform our daily lives. You said the methods used in nutritional epidemiology are pseudoscientific. What makes them pseudoscientific? Well, in our paper, we lay out the scientific criteria for any data collection protocol. It has to be publicly accessible. In other words, anyone should be able to see the data. And it's quite clear that if you're reporting on a memory, you're telling us that you had an apple yesterday, well, the only person that has access to that data is you. You have, you have privileged access to your memory. And that memory is not quantifiable, it's not measurable, and it's not falsifiable. There are distorting and non, no, intentional and non-intentional distorting factors. There are false memories. There's lies. People may not tell, wish to tell us what they, what they truly ate. If you think of an individual who suffered the stigma of obesity, we live in a society where the um, individuals suffering from obesity have to listen every day that they're not eating well and that they're lazy. And we have this moralizing and demoralizing social and scientific discourse that surrounds obesity. So of course they're not necessarily going to tell us the truth. And may, they may not even realize they're not telling us the truth. And when an epidemiologist asks someone what they ate yesterday, they're collecting anecdotes. And the plural of anecdote is not scientific data, it's stories. And I don't think our public health guidelines should be based on stories. It should be based on rigorous science. The American public and our patients deserve the best possible science. And when we divert funds from the best, most rigorous science to pseudoscience, people die. If these methods are so obviously flawed, why are researchers still using them? I think um, what we're seeing is the confluence of self-interest and, and institutional inertia, and unfortunately the training of generations of scientists. The, the government-funded researchers have gained enough money that they train multiple generations. So when you get a government grant, you then can hire multiple students to work for you, and you train those students in those methods. If those methods are pseudoscientific, and nutrition epidemiologic methods certainly are, what happens is every generation becomes further and further removed from science to the point when none of them have even a passing familiarity of, with the scientific method, with the ideas of falsification and quantification and measurement. In your paper, you say diet is no longer a risk factor for disease, but we've heard for years now that we are what we eat. Well, I think the, the, the greatest lie in public health is we are what we eat. Um, it's not. We are what our body does with what we eat, and the term for that is nutrient partitioning. Um, it's a fancy way of saying the metabolic fate of the foods we consume, what happens to the energy we eat. Um, in my paper in January 2015 of this year, I presented the first comprehensive explanatory narrative of obesity and um, type 2 diabetes. And I focused on the intergenerational transmission, uh, the non-genetic evolution of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And this is just a fancy way of saying how mothers pass on their obesity and their diabetes risk to their child. 
and the greatest determinant of this is her physical activity during pregnancy and her body mass during pregnancy. And with each generation, we've had the snowballing effects of adiposity and inactivity. So the focus on diet and these methods, these pseudoscientific methods, keep us focused on diet. And they keep us, they, they raise so many problems that we're afraid of eating the foods that have been part of our diet for thousands and thousands of years. And they misdirect our attention from the true causes of obesity, the true causes of the risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. It's, it's unfortunate, as long as we're looking at something that has a trivial impact on our health. And at this point in our nation, diet has, is not a major risk factor. The last Centers for Disease Control analysis demonstrated that 80% of Americans are not at risk for any of the micronutrients that they tested for. A, D, E, C, K, folate, and iron. 90% of our population are not at risk for these. Yet 95% of our population is not meeting the physical activity guidelines. So if 80% of our population is not at risk for nutritional deficiencies and 95% of our population is at risk for physical inactivity, what's the pathology? Where should we put our energy? Where should we put our resources? Right now, we spend over $2 billion a year um, studying nutrition and obesity. And in the NIH's list of 250 categories for spending, exercise, cardiorespiratory fitness, and physical activity are not even on that list. So as long as our dietary guidelines are causing fear, they're, they're creating a situation where we're afraid of eating cholesterol and eggs and meat and cheese, things that have been a part of our diet for thousands of years, as long as we're afraid of that, we're not paying attention to what we should be paying attention to. We need to change our lifestyle. And it's not changing what we eat, it's changing what we do. Because how we spend our day determines what our body does with the food we eat. And when you're pregnant, that's even the more important because how you spend your day determines not only your health, but the health of future generations. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yes, I think um, probably the most important thing to remember is that most of the non-communicable diseases that we're thinking of, uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease and cancer, all of these begin in utero. So the most important nine months of anyone's life are the nine months before birth. So ultimately, if we are interested in helping the future of the, of the American people, if we're actually truly interested in improving and providing ev evidence, scientific evidence, for improving the health, then what we need to do is we need to improve the lives of young women and would-be mothers. So we hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.